a baby leopard seal there called Silas. And Silas is one of the stars of Ice Pups, mm. a new documentary following a pack of leopard seals over one Antarctic winter. Hydrogeleptonics, to use the Latin Ooh. term. I've yeah, done a little bit of reading, so... Someone's very keen. Yeah, well, I'm keen. I'm, I'm keen to give of my best. Here to tell us more about these mustachioed mammals is the show's creator, Alice Clunt. Welcome. Oh, it's Alice Fluck. Right, I see what I've done. <laughs> so, Alice, uh, this isn't your first time getting close to the animal kingdom, is it? Once upon a time, you were shortlisted in the Shell Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. Yeah, many moons ago, mm. yes. The oil company, Shell. They used to yeah. sponsor it, yes. yes. Well, do you know what? Good for them. I mean, you know, they get a lot of stick, don't they, for the Exxon Valdez oil spill, but then they sponsor a prize for animal photos, and you think, hmm, maybe it's time to take a fresh look at Shell. Uh, but tell us about ice pups, because leopard seal pups really are the most incredible animals, aren't oh, they? They really are, Jenny. I mean, what you see in the pups, and hopefully in the film, is their spirit and mm. their personality. Because, don't forget, these guys are living in the most inhospitable place in the whole world. Mm. You know, they are tough. You do not want to mess with a, with a leopard seal. Well over a <laughs> tonne, uh, teeth like giant daggers, top speed of 20 knots. A German U-boat commander would kill for velocity like that. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. Well, what you see in the film, they do have this wonderfly playful mm. side as yeah. well. And yeah. how? They toss penguins around like a rag doll and batter them against the seat till they're dead. Just wait for it. For fun. Mm. Brutal. Mm. Well, they're, they're, they're mischievous, uh, certainly. And, and that comes from just being so intelligent. Well, the Allies train them to deliver mines strapped to their backs to scuttle enemy craft in harbour. Boom. Successful. We don't really touch on that on this film. This film is more about them in infancy and adolescence, and hopefully it's one the whole family can enjoy. Aww. Aww. Wrong tone. Wow, they're plucky little so-and-sos, though, aren't they? They have to be. You know, they're only weaned for a month, oh. and then it's up to them to fend for themselves. Oh, breaks your heart, doesn't it? <laughs> when you're around them such a long time, it, it is hard not to get attached. Oh. Oh, I think I'm a bit in love. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Bless them. Oh. They're the most adorable little creatures. Mm. They seem to have such personality. You almost want to give them a name. Well, don't th you? This one's called Silas. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I know. I mean, a better one, though, like Richard. Oh, I don't know whether to eat him up or wear him. Do you know what I mean, though? I suppose Eskimos do both. Well, you find leopard seals in the Antarctic. Falklanders, then. Now, Alice, uh, the film ends with the sound of a seal cry, and it's quite a sound, isn't it? <laughs> uh, actually, let's hear it. Not a sound you forget. No. <laughs> when I heard that, I had an overwhelming sense of Gary Newman. And you know the other musician I was thinking of? Don't know why. Seal. I do know why. Uh, it it's almost sounds sort of philosophical, doesn't it? Yes. I don't think that's the right word, Jenny. I think it's remindful. It uh, reminded me of my granddad. Did it? Yeah. He made funny noises and he had whiskers and he liked fish. Mm. He was a smashing granddad. One of my earliest memories, actually, is him uh, taking me to the fun fair, and me asking for a candy floss, and then eventually he gave in and got me one, and took me home, uh, said goodbye, but left his hat. And when I ran to the bus stop, uh, he wasn't there. And I saw he was walking up the hill. That's when I realised he'd spent his bus fare on my candy floss. Grandad Graham. Grandad. And you can see the whole of Alice's film on BBC One tomorrow night. Alice Clant. Fluck. Fuck. Fluck. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening and welcome to This Time with me, Jenny Gresham, and the man I am delighted, no, tickled pink, to announce is my new permanent co-host, Alan Park. I'd like to tickle you pink. Uh, tickle you pink. So, end of an era, start of a new one. Thank you. So many messages, the vast majority being positive. Uh, also had a great meeting with the team, uh, had a few drinks, a few canapes, said a few words. Uh, you respect me, I'll respect you. It's as simple as that. It was a good atmosphere. Yeah. Now, plenty in store tonight. First, it's National Teenage Week. So every day we've been focusing on a different aspect of teenage life and getting down with Britain's youth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Take a look. What's up? <laughs> Emerald. Yes. Yeah, um, so, uh, oh yeah. Uh, now very quickly. Now we're uh, co-hosting. We should probably meet at Mindfulness Annual once a week. Uh, you know, just to get to know each other, foster a bit of rapport. 
Doesn't have to be lasagna. It could be fish and chips on the cenotaph with a couple of cans. Okay, lovely. Yeah, I think good. It's a great idea. Thank you. All right. <laughs> no, it's good. And you're right about the chemistry. It's all about the chemistry. Good, great. I feel like the audience can just smell insincerity. Absolutely. It's, it's like an animal instinct. It is an animal instinct. Have you ever seen Noel Edmonds talk to contestants? They won't let cats in the studio because they start to hiss. Yeah. Well, look, I think it'll be fun because it will give us a chance to air any concerns, any quibbles, and it'll be great. This is Dale. Oh, hi, Dale. I'm Jenny. Nice hey. to meet you. What do you mean, what do you mean quibbles? What do you mean? I'll tell you later. You can't do, you can't do that. Five. Tell me now. You can't Four. do that. Just tell me. All right, fine. It's your diction. Thank you. Welcome back. Tomorrow, our focus is on teenage angst and the troubling issue of self-harm. Oh, well, that's a tough issue, actually. The closest I've ever come to self-harm, I guess, would be I used to pluck nasal hairs when I was angry with myself after a show had gone badly. Sometimes poke my skin with one, I think. That would make a good sword for an ant. But today, we look at youth unemployment, a trend that has caused particular decay among Scottish inner cities. And yet I know, anecdotally, from friends with large gardens that Scottish people can make great workers. It's a shame. We're joined on the sofa by Dale Daniels, himself long-term unemployed, who now campaigns to improve prospects for Scottish youth. Dale, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Hi. Now, you're furious, aren't you? Even for a Scot. Well, so should everyone be, huh? And they've Absolutely. Got, hmm? A so-called developed nation, you know, letting kids rot away in these estates, huh? Indeed. When I grew up, hmm? I thought you were, please. Oh, when I grew up, there was industry, there was factories, and shipbuilding in the Clyde. You know, work if you wanted it. That, that's not there anymore, huh? And Absolutely. What? Sorry. So what happens? You know, I mean, kids fall into a cycle of crime and, and we lay the blame at them. But we did that, huh? You don't agree? No, I do. So how do we get out of this vicious cycle? Is it education, training? Aye, but it's bigger than that, eh? Eh. It's, you know, it's about seeing the world from, well, from their point of view, huh? No. Uh. You know, we closed down Sure Start and, and football pitches and youth centres and you... You wonder why the kids get any bother, huh? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if you have any kids, huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Huh. Well, uh, I've got a 13-year-old, yeah, and that's why I'm saying to the government, all you're doing is building problems for the future, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. It's amazing, uh, because, uh, weirdly, what you're saying actually makes sense. Eh? Mm? Aye. Aye. Good. Good. Jimmy, Jenny. Well, thank you so much, Dale Daniels. Finding the time to stay in shape isn't easy. I donned my sweatbands and leotard to find out how one street in Walsall are getting in shape. But first, how many of you out there are 100 years old? More than you might think. National statistics say there are 14,000 centenarians in the UK. And that's enough to fill the Birmingham arena. Wow. Yeah, although presumably they need a lot more toilets. The latest addition to that exclusive 100 Club received her telegram from the Queen this very morning. And as her granddaughter writes, she's a big fan of this show. Aw, here's what she wrote. 20 seconds. Where's my fucking water? I made it very clear I need a glass of water after exercise or else white saliva forms at the corners of my mouth. Well, Whose is this? That's mine. Careful, it's fizzy. What? And I'm delighted to say Rose Haig joins us on the line now. Rose, are you there, my love? Well, of course I'm here. Where else would I be? <laughs> Rose, many congratulations. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> many congratulations. <coughs> Hello? <coughs> There we go. Rose, can you tell us where... No, leave it here. Here. Because if you leave it there, I can't reach it, you stupid girl. Rose, I believe your father was a, a captain now, stationed course, in the I army. grew up in the Raj, 1930s. Yes. Mm. It's perfectly pleasant. Uh, one can be rather misty-eyed. Uh, uh, of course, the hangover was rather botched. Mountbatten did what he could, poor old Dickie, Ratchet. That's lovely. I was just so wondering, wondering about uh, the secret to your old age. I'm talking, young man. 
You Sorry. normally interrupt people when they're speaking. I've been called a young man for quite some time. Stop mumbling. Why are you staring at me? What's your name? I'm a portrait. The point being, we had a houseboy. Not a friend, you understand, an right. employee. Okay. He used to run errands, <laughs> and we called him Brownie. Right. Not the sharpest of fellows, but curiously, he was not an Indian. Okay. He was a Negro. And they are very different, because uh. whilst physically stronger, they... Oh. Oh dear, uh, we seem all right. oh, we seem to yeah. be oh, we seem to have lost Rose there. But yes, a great achievement and a colourful character. Different times, different times, and uh, apologies there for the wind and the racism. Hilary Couchman, Doctor Hilary Couchman. How long have humans been swearing? Well, curse words or vulgarities go back really as far as language itself. But when it comes to written English, we find profanities cropping up from the 13th century. So, something like this. Should I wear gloves to handle this? The protocol is that the curator handles the material. Oh, OK. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure I've seen Dr David Starkey handling stuff like this on TV. And I've even seen them let Tony Robinson have a fiddle. The protocol is the curator handles the material. Well, you said that. Do they ever let you guys go to an area just to relax? Because they, they should do. Maybe that should be part of the protocol. Swearing, swear words. One of the more prominent words is the word f But c too is also common across the Germanic and Scandinavian languages. Yeah. We also find uses of piss, c c well, c What, 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 where, where, what areas would these profanities emanate from? I'm thinking Manchester, Liverpool. No, from across the whole country. Okay. Now, what we have here are parish records from Drayton in Shropshire. Uh, when would that be? 1295. That's what these trousers cost. So, what these documents show is how the earliest instances of swear words were typically found in the names of places or people. Mm -hmm. So, surnames often describe what someone was or did. Right. Here we have a listing for um, Henry f a beggar. Goodness me. Now, back then, the word f didn't have its current meaning. Okay. It actually referred to hitting or striking. Right, good. Uh, well, hence the phrase, let's hire some Albanians to f him up. So there are terms that have fallen out of use. So here in 1740, uh, we have the term rantalian, oh, okay. which means Musical one whose word. scrotum is so relaxed as to be longer than his penis. One wonders whether that's due to a truncated member or uh, distended testes? Well, I guess it's just chicken and egg. Um, we also find some fairly vulgar slang words for penis, such as beard splitter mm -hmm. and arse opener, whilst fellatio was known as bagpiping. Oh, makes sense. In the 1785 book, The Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, mm -hmm. we find the term to huffle. Would you like to have a guess at what that means? Oh, gosh, I'll have a bash. Um, uh, to huffle um, the act of putting my head between a lady's breasts and uh, huffling. Uh, you get the picture. No, it's, it's another word to fillate. <laughs> right, OK. I always find it amusing uh, when I ask people that question, what answer I'll get. <laughs> right, well, that's an interesting part of the protocol. Um, thank you very much, Dr Hilary Mantel. Couchman. Well, one who likes to squat over another... It's my surname. Right, yes, of course.